some application. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation, and I would like to thank Chang Q and Johnson for of my elder brother, and I feel so happy at home. Yeah, actually, in a Chinese society, the family, the family tie is very, very important. But in Taiwan, I feel so alone. There are only, I think, four Michigan graduates in Taiwan, but the, the rest of them soon get retired from doing research after they leave Ann Arbor. So I remember whenever I go to the gathering and always stay aside and looking at the Miley at the other family gathering. And here, I, the first time in my life, I feel I, I have elder brother, I have a family <laughs> tie also. Yeah, I'm serious, I'm so happy. And also in Taiwan, there are a lot, a huge group of anomalies from Purdue. So one day there is a Purdue anomaly. He, he, he's tired of doing research, so he get, uh, he got rid of the academic job, and he opened a fancy, very, very fancy restaurant, a five-star level. So one day I saw in a, in a label uh, of our institute, there is an announcement. If you are Purdue alumni, then you can get, have, I think it's 50% off. <laughs> <laughs> I, at the time, we think, oh, I shouldn't go to Ann Arbor. I should go to Purdue instead. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> thank you for, for the effort of uh, organizing this meeting. Okay, so I will follow my elder brother, Chong, Chong Q, and I will briefly introduce, um, uh, okay, uh, not introduce, now I, I get stuck. Anyway, <laughs> explain the way I, I went to Ann Arbor. I arrived Ann Arbor in uh, 1988, it's so long ago. Actually, at the beginning, I don't have any background in differential geometry. At the beginning, I chose Professor Peter Duran as my advisor, as a, a complex variable. And at the second year, we start doing research. Actually, I think if I stay with him, I will finish very quite soon. And then the second year, Professor Dan Burns has offered a course in, in introduction, introduction to several complex variables. So I went to the course, and I think, oh, this professor is so smart. He knows everything. <laughs> but in fact, in fact, I know nothing what he told me in the Bible. <laughs> I think I assume everywhere is great. So at the end of the semester, I switched from, them, from Professor Duran to, to Dan Burns. And at the same time, the summer, I went back to Taiwan. That's my first coming back to Taiwan. And I met my classmate. He is a smart student. He's the best student in Taiwan University. And he knows me very well. And he said, oh, Su Jen, you are getting suicide soon. Because you know, you are a, a girl. You, you always lose duration. You don't have any idea and duration. How, how dare you to study uh, geometry? OK, but anyway, I switch. I start from zero. But the sad thing is this guy, actually, he got suicide. No. Yeah, because he's so, so frustrated on, on his research. But that's um, uh, about 10 years before. Yeah, and I didn't get suicide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then I worked with Dan Burns, Professor Burns. And then I think the first research top, uh, the first thesis problem he gave to me is uh, computing some CI invariant. That's related to a work of uh, Nancy Stanton on heat kernel, something like that. And I have kept on working on computing the CI invariant for maybe one and a half years, I think. But we got stuck. It turned out to be an analytic number theory problem. And I think I went to Professor Montgomery a lot, and still we cannot do that. It, you know, at the end, the thing become an analytic number theory. We have to do a lot of uh, gamma functions, something like that. So I, really, I, I was really, really frustrated. I don't know whether I can ever finish my PhD degree. I think that's maybe one and a half later, one and, one and a half years later. So one day I went to Professor Burns' office, and then he gave me a problem on ground tube. That's the first time I, I heard about this kind of thing. Actually, it's a top complex structure. So he asked me to, to read some paper of Lampert and Zerk, and then Gilliman and Stenzel. But I argued with him. I said, Professor Burns, I haven't finished this CR invariant yet. I want to do this. Then he just smiled. I said, Su Jian, is your degree important or solving this problem important? I said, oh, yes, my degree is more important. 
<laughs> so I put this aside. Then <laughs> I'm very practical. Okay, so I start uh, working on this grow tube. And actually, now is um, I think I start working on this maybe on 1992, something like that. And the first development on this kind of complex structure was first finished on 1990 by Gilman and Stenzel and Lemper and Zerg. And when I look back after almost 20 years, I'm always so grateful to, per to Professor Burns of uh, introducing me to this subject. Because first of all, this subject is quite new at the time. Secondly, there are very, very, very few people pay attention to this subject. Even nowadays, when I talk about grouters, grower tip, what is that? And sometimes I feel ashamed, but after 20 years, I'm really grateful because I went back to Taiwan right after my, I finished my degree. So, because this is not, not a hot, hot object, and Taiwan is a remote island. It's so, you know, yeah, it's barbarian area, barbarian, yeah, something like that. But if I do something very hot, very popular, then I don't think I can compete with other people, and I don't like that kind of pressure. But in Taiwan, and I don't teach, I have full time, I can develop the thing I want. I'm really appreciate, I, seriously. I think that's the lucky thing of my life. And, and also fortunately, I don't have any student, I don't teach, so uh, there's no danger of bringing bad luck to my students, <laughs> okay? So, and I remember, um, I finished on 1994. I remember before I went back to Taiwan, I got a, a job in Taiwan in the Academia Sinica, right? Uh, actually, it's before, before my defense. Um, after I got a job, we do defense, and then I think I lived at the sum, in the summer of 1994. Before I left, I went to say goodbye to Professor Burns, and I told Professor Burns, Professor Burns, I'm so, so, so scared. I know so little, and I don't know what to do, but I, I have to do the first review in, in four years. I think at the time, Taiwan has changed. Everything has to, and we, we start from a system. But before my days, you, once you go there, you got tenure, you got everything. And I said, I'm so, so scared. I know just so little. I only know growth. I know nothing. How can I survive? And Professor Benz just laughed. You got to believe yourself. So actually, over the past 20 years, um, I think I, I become very tough. I, I wasn't like this way 20 years before. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I learned to, um, I learned to believe myself. You got to, I got to believe myself. And uh, more and more, I, because actually I work alone. And at the beginning, I also hope I can get help from other people. Always, yeah, and, and I admire they have very good connection. But I don't have, I don't have, I have nothing, really nothing. And I never went back to Ann Arbor, only uh, for a formal um, visit. But I learned to, and now I have strong belief that you are the only one who can help you. Don't even dream me. Don't even dream anybody will help you. Yeah. Okay, so and I'm really grateful to, Burns, to Professor Burns for telling me you've got to believe yourself. Okay. So now uh, I think today, okay, the subject Professor Burns has introduced to me is ground tube. Um, actually, I have kept doing the ground tube and by doing this, this problem, I think I build up my background Actually, when I finish, I know very little. I'm serious. I know nothing. <laughs> and then I, I, I start build up my own, my own knowledge, my own background by doing this, job, this, prob, uh, this problem. And then I think, uh, actually, I'm quite happy. Uh, in, a, in the first 10 years of my career, the only thing I know is growl tube. And actually, when I give a talk on growl tube, the, People always question, "Why is this for? Why is this for? It doesn't mean meaning. Uh, it doesn't mean useful, okay?" And um, in actually, it's in night, uh, 2005, I filed an application to this grow tube, and I am very, very happy. And I think, 
Yeah, I, 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 define, I deprove to everybody this ground tube construction is useful, okay? So use the ground tube construction. We proved the theory. We proved that. This is the theory I prove. Actually, this is published on um, 2007, because, but because there is the, in this opportunity, I think it's good to present this here, and perhaps Professor Burns never noticed this, this result before, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is published, yeah. And after that, I switched to another, I developed my own method, and I switched to another subject, and I have other co co collaborators. Oh, so I think this is a good opportunity to have an extended thesis defense. So the theory <laughs> I, I'm going to, to present is that G be a connected D group. Here, the one thing important <laughs> is this can be compact or non-compact. It doesn't matter. This is the key thing. Given a connected D group, then you can always find a good complex manifold. How good? It is completely hyperbolic and each time such that this G, this given G, is the automorphism group of this complex manifold. Furthermore, the dimension is the same. Okay? Sometimes people call this the realization problem. Realization means to realize a lead group as an automorphism group. So let me introduce the background of this, uh, uh, about this problem. In 1932, Elliot Katong, he proved that if D is a bounded domain in CN, then the automorphism group is a lead group. It's a lead group. Okay, later on, Kobayashi, I think it's 1967, something like this. Yeah, 67, Kobayashi. Kobayashi proved that, in general, if D is a hyperbolic manifold, I think this hyperbolic, the, this terminology has been introduced by Professor Seki Yang two days ago. That means the Kobayashi Kobayashi pseudo metric is really a metric, okay? If D is a hyperbolic manifold, then the automorphism group is a lead group. Okay, then of course we are curious whether the converse also hold. Means if you have a lead group, whether you can find something such that this D group is the automorphism group of this complex manifold. Okay, so this is the thing. Given a D group, we can always find good, not only complex manifold, it's a very good complex manifold such that this D group is the automorphism group of this complex manifold. Okay, so when, if this G, this G lead group is compact, when it's compact, this result was known by a bad four and that oak. And also, there are two groups of people. In 1987, appear at the same time in different journal. They say if G is a compact group, then they can find actually this, this in this situation is a strongly pseudo convex domain, bounded strongly pseudo convex domain. This is. D is bounded, strictly pseudo-convex domain in CN, such that the prescri prescribed automorphism group is G. This, is, this was actually done a long time ago in 1987. And the difficult here, here the compactness is essential. Why? Because for compact lead group, I think many people have license in compact lead group. For compact lead group, given a compact lead group, we can always do the canonical uh, uh, complexification GC. It's G mod exponential I. This is the Lie algebra, okay, of the Lie. And in this way, you can more or less view this is the G the D group, and then this is complexification. This is IG, okay? So you can play things. This is more or less like you complex by R to C, 
okay? You, they use this complexification, okay? You can always play on this and then do a one-one -one correspondence. And the difficulty in non-compact Lie group is there is no such kind of complexification. There is no colonial complexification to a non-compact Lie group. There are some kind of complexification to non-compact Lie group, but the result is, okay, for non-compact, I think it's Hochschild, um, they call universal complexification. If G is non-compact, of course, you can also try to develop some kind of complexification. You get GC. In a, stand, uh, in a classic book of Hochschild, they have, they have introduced it. I think they call universal complexification. And the difficulty is, in this case, if this is a real dimension N, suppose this is a real dimension N, this kind of complexification in general has less dimension. And this is not a good complexification. Yeah, it's, you know, usually this is a real dimension n. Then you get some kind of complexification. Your dimension will become less. Then it's not good. So in, this is why people never try to do the non-compact case after so many years. So in any case, so to tackle this problem, the compact case is done. So the thing that our, our approach can apply to compact or non-compact, it doesn't matter the, in the same. But the thing really important is we can, t we can deal with a non-compact case, okay? So from here, I have, I have said that the key thing is the complexification. And this complexification doesn't work for the non-compact case. So to tackle the problem, we have to find another kind of complexification. So that's the ground tube thing. Actually, let me explain. When I start a ground tube thing a uh, long time ago, actually, I didn't know about this. I, I actually, I know nothing. I never read any, any research paper. And then that's after 10 years, after I got my tenure. Oh, I'm so. I'm so great, this growth tube have given me a tenure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so, so grateful to this growth tube. And then actually right after my tenure, I, I still feel so angry. No, I still feel, I don't know how to say, because I still feel how come people think what I'm doing is silly. I still, I, yeah, because, you know, this is not a field that people has advertised a lot. And I cannot persuade people this is important because I cannot get any application. I cannot convince them this is good. So I still, I'm eager to try to find some application. I want to show people this is not a nonsense object. Although I have my tenure already, I can live happily forever. And then after I get my tenure, I find this, this theory and I give a pro, I give a application and I think good. Grow tube is good. I can use grow tube to prove the theory. Okay, so let me go back to grow tube. So what is a grow tube thing? It is kind of, from there you can see that that's kind of complexification, different from the, you know, the, the traditional one. So now, let's work on a real analytic Riemann manifold. Given any real analytic Riemann manifold, this means M is a um, real analytic, and the matrix G is an, a real analytic as well. Then we try to do, this is a real analytic Riemann model for M, G. We try to define some complex structure on the tangent bundle, okay? We try to define complex structure. Let me say, um, this is not real on the whole tangent bundle. Maybe perhaps just a small neighborhood around the zero section of the neighborhood. But just I, to uh, simplify things, just let me say this way. Okay, we try to define uh, some complex structure on, on the tangent bundle. Okay, and here, the thing we deal with is a remaining manifold. So there is a metric associate. Okay, so of course, in a traditional way, the whitening and Grow or something like that. They, oh, they have a way to complexify a 
a manifold. They just complexify the local chart, okay? They didn't consider the metric. But here we have a metric. We have to make, we have to define the, the, the complex structure associated to this given metric. So the way we define it is, okay, an um, complex structure. J on TM. It's not really on TM, but anyway, in TM, it's called an adapt complex structure if, okay, now you're given a geodesic. This is a Riemannian metaphor, so it's okay to talk about geodesic. Given a geodesic gamma, in M, G. Then, then the map from C, we know C, and we know the complex structure. This is good, to here. How can I write it? Mm, the complex vocation of this. Oh, what is, um, let me say this way. This is gamma, okay? And you have a parametrization by arc length. You start from here. So this is RT, and this is a tangent vector. In each tangent vector at T, you can, I think, how, how to say it in English? Scale. Yeah, you can, yeah, thanks. <laughs> this is quite a divisor for. <laughs> okay, you can, you can scale this length. So here is, uh, Okay, so this 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 map, this I call phi r with respect to the to the metric r from t plus i s to this point to this point. You know, this is a set in a tangent bundle. So we have this complex structure. Okay, Th here there is a complex structure. There is a complex structure and a map from t plus i s to this point. Uh, okay, is holomorphic. Is holomorphic. Now it 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 does make sense to talk about holomorphic mapping because here we have complex structure. Here we have complex structure. Okay, if this hold for any, if this hold for any, for any geodesic, then we call this complex structure a double a complex structure on the tangent bundle. Okay, so let me give. Um, an example. The first example is trivial one. When M is the Rn, okay? When M is Rn, so why is the adapt complex structure? It's just the usual complexification. So here. Ah, let me, sorry. I ha we have to, I will start the ground tube. Okay, so what is the ground tube? What is a ground tube? Okay, a ground tube, I use this notation of radius R on this, uh, around this Grimman manifold is the set of tangent vectors. Okay, V is TXM with length, it's actually the Dix bundle. Okay, this is M. It's a Dix bundle of length R, okay? So this is the ground tube. Topologically, it's just a this bundle of radius R equipped with, but this is um, equipped with the complex structure, okay? So this is called a ground tube. Ground tube of radius R, okay? Topologically, it's a Dix bundle and equipped with the complex structure. This we call a ground tube. So let me give two examples. First one, when the center, when the Riemann manifold is the Euclidean space, so where's the ground tube of radius C or radius R? It's just the cylinder, I think, cylinder. A cylinder of radius R, okay? This is a trivial case. Now. We give a, a, a non-trivial case because the R and we know it. Are you missing an I somewhere? The tube is X 
the, the tube is, no, this is a tube, sorry. This is a tube. So the tube the, consists of, the, is a real vector, tangents? Yes, yes, of lens R, less than R. Okay, so this is N, and I, 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 I like to write this way. Okay? Here, on this, on, 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 this, on this set of things. Okay? And the complex structure is defined by this way. And Lamper has proved the existence of this complex structure. The existence is proved as, as, as a work of Lamper. Okay? So, this is a um, standard example, but this one tells us nothing because everybody knows that. Now we give a non-standard example. It's Keller. It's Keller. It's Keller. And, okay, with respect to this complex structure, the function, this function, though, though defined on the point, is actually the length square. And this also work of Lamper. This one is strictly pro subharmonic function with respect to this complex structure. It's a color manifold. It's, it has very good property as everything. So now I give a non-trivial example. When M is a real hyperbolic space, real hyperbolic space means the sectional curvature is constant negative one, okay? And we can view this uh, real hyperbolic state, uh, real hyperbolic manifold in the Bohr model, okay? We view this, we view this as the BN with the Poincare metric. I think this metric I call H, okay? Then there are many ways to view the real hyperbolic space. So we view that as a disk, a disk with some spatial metric. Then we try to see the ground tube over HN. Now let me draw this way. I draw this first. Here, this is, this is <laughs> I don't know how to draw. Here's a, this piece is HN. It's the disk with the, it's the disk, the ball, with the Poincare metric, okay? So what is the ground tube? Here, this white part, this part, this is our center, HN, okay? And actually, when you, when you do the, the ground tube, this red one, you will get a ball at some radius. So the red one is actually pi over half, HN. When you construct ground tube over real hyperbolic space, at some distance, at some radius, you will get uh, the ball, okay? And here, when the radius is less than pi half, uh, pi half, you'll get something like this. Okay, this is, this is not a ball, I, I shouldn't draw this one. The red one is the only, the only ball we can have. So this is a ground tube of some, um, here, R is less than pi half. And then when the la radius get larger, again, you can also get something like this. This is also ground tube. But the maximum radius, at, okay, the maximum is pi. The radius cannot be larger than pi. If it's greater than pi, then the thing blow up. There is a mong jong pair equation that will blow up. So this is the full model of a uh, uh, ground tube over the real hyperbolic space. At the radius pi half, you will get a ball, okay? When the radius is less than pi half, you will get strictly pseudo-convex domains. This is strictly pseudo-convex. When the radius is greater than pi half, you will get a pseudo-convex here. It's not strongly pseudo-convex. It's just weakly pseudo-convex, okay? So actually, when my, in my thesis, I did some computation in, in CI invariant on ground tubes. And that time, we find out that if the center is a real hyperbolic space, then at some level, this thing is spherical. Spherical in CR terms means everywhere is like a sphere. So let's, in my thesis, but then I went back to Taiwan, and I'm really alone, there's nobody to ask. And I have to, to, to survive, <laughs> okay? So I tried to find something to, to work. And then the first theory, after I graduate, is the following. 
the only thing I know is ground tube, so I have to stick on it. The theory I prove is the ground tube and the ground tube. This is any ground tube. Is the ball, the complex ball, if and only if. There is only one possibility. This M is the real hyperbolic space, and the radius is pi half. Okay, this is the, the first thing. I think I, I, don't, I finished this on 90. I finished, I got my degree on 94. This is 90, 95, I think, and published 96, I think. Okay, so this is the theory that we do. The ball tube is a ball, if and only if. The center is a real hyperbolic, and radius is pi half. And also, on the way to do this, we, we also observe something. Now, this real hyperbolic space is non-compact. If we consider compact, okay, if we compactify it, we compactify that by some dis discrete subgroup of isometry. If this is compact, and we observe that when this is compact, this T R H N the automorphism group is really the isometry group of this compact group. And this is very interesting, okay? So let me say that, let me, let's observe once, once more the, the special things about the ball. You see, this is the ball. And there is one, one thing special about the ball. This is the ball. And this is our center, HN. We know this ball is a ground tube, a radius or a pi half. OK? Now, you look at this ball. You can see that this is our center. But now, if you rotate your center, you will get something. This is another center. And you can view this ball as the ground tube over this center. Okay, and now you rotate once more, you rotate to here. Again, you can view this ball as the ground tube <coughs> over this new center. So in this ball case, there are many, many possible centers. Okay, it's because the ball is too symmetry. But we wonder, perhaps the ball is the only case with this kind of property. Because now you draw your, your ground tube in this way. And it's hard to believe, okay? This is a radio, this is distance r, this is distance r. It's hard to believe that you can move your center. Intuitively, it's, it's hard to believe that there's another center, okay? So we try to prove that. This we call the rigidity theory. And the theory we get is the following. Actually, after this, I do a series of problems in rigidity. And then after rigidity, let's give an a application to the rigidity, OK? So I call the rigidity theory, rigidity. Maybe I call rigidity theory. And the best we can get is the following. Now, if M is a homogeneous, non-compact, compact, doesn't matter. If a homogeneous, remind metaphor, then there are two possibilities. Either this ground tube, we consider the ground tube over this Riemann manifold, either it's the ball, or the automorphism group of this, uh, of this ground tube is the isometry group of N. OK. And let's see well, how come this ball is so spatial. OK. Let's introduce the. The main tool of doing this is a generalized um, Rosé Wang theory. Let me say Rosé Wang. Oh, Professor Kim will say Wang Rosé. OK, I will say Wang Rosé. Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> OK, Wang Rosé theory. Actually, I, I have never heard about this before. That's a joint work with Dama. Dama, Dama, Dama told me this. Uh, Dawe Ma, Dawe Ma, OK. <laughs> So this is a standard theory in, in complex barrel. It says that if D is a bounded strictly pseudo convex domain in Cn, okay, this is strictly pseudo convex, 
And one, Professor Wang first showed that if D is a traditional, uh, bounded as traditional convex domain in CN, if you can find a point P in D, and you can find a sequence of automorphism group. Okay, there is a sequence of automorphism group such that this sequence of group, automorphism group send this interior point to some boundary point as they go to infinity. Then this D is ball. This was first proved by, by Wang. But later on, Rosé, he has improved the theory. He said that if D is a bounded, again, bounded, bounded, bounded is important. It's a bounded domain in CN, and he just skipped this. And if you can find interior point P and a sequence of automorphism group sending this interior point to some boundary point, such that this Q is a traditional convex boundary point, then this must be the ball, okay? This is a Rosé Wang theory. Um, Bawe Ma has to do, um, I have to join work. First I do it, and then at some status, I don't know how to go in on, so I send him all my manuscript I have. And he's, he's very, very smart. He knows this, and he, he finished the second part of our joint paper very, very fast. But I'm so grateful to him, because before this, I never heard about Rosé, Rosé Wang. Okay, so after this, we have joint work. And then, at the time, we do the constant curvature case. But in that case, I can write everything as a bounded domain. Okay, I can, I can, I can formulate everything as bounded. I can construct a domain. So after we have bounded domain, Dama, Dama, uh, Dawe Ma can finish this very soon. Okay, that's the, the, how we work together. And then, but, the thing is, we would like to, to try non-compact case. And again, from compact to non-compact is usually very, very difficult. And here, Rosé Wang theory only work for compact case. There is no non-compact case. And I remember at the time, I didn't work with uh, Dawe Ma anymore. And I don't have any paper. And I, I was so, so, so frustrated. <laughs> and the only thing you know, I know is, I must, I want to show this. But for me, the only hope is I can prove a generalized version of Rosé Wang theory. And I surveyed an article, I think that's like 2000 in, in, in uh, MS things. And I think it's impossible. But, but that's the only hope. I still have to go through the review and I might be kicked out. <laughs> so this is the only hope I have. Um, but it's, it seems so impossible. How can people do the non-compact case. If it's not so hard, then people must have done this before. But in any way, I think sometimes naivety is a power. I just work. And then I prove the, I call the generalized Rosé Wang theory. We can do that. Okay, Wang Rosé. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, Professor Kim will kill me. <laughs> Okay, we do the non-compact case. The non-compact case means that if you have a complex manifold, again, you can, if you can find an interior point and a sequence of automorphism group, sending this interior point to a point, this is, this set on the boundary, and this is a traditional convex. Of course, we got to be very careful. Here is manifold case, and this is omega. To say this is a boundary, this omega must sit on at this here, on a bigger manifold, to, to talk about the boundary, okay? So if you can do this, then this complex manifold is the ball. And the method we use is the Pinchuk rescaling theory, okay? Rescaling you, you have here, and you do some some very clever rescaling by, by Chin Pinchuk, it's not by me. Then you can do this. And actually, this generalized Rosé Wang theory is the tool, it's the weapon we can stop this. Without that, I don't know how to do that, okay? So let me say two words on, on this, on how to apply this Rosé Wang theory to that. Here, 
if it's not a ball, okay, ball is exceptional, okay. If it's not a ball, we want to show the isometry group is an automorphism group. Means the automorphism was really decided by the auto, by the isometry of the center. So the proof, the sketch of the proof, the idea of the proof is the following. Now suppose I want to I want to prove by contradiction. Prove by contradiction. Okay, I want to say that, I want to say if this automorphism group is larger, it's really larger than the isometry group, then it has to be the ball. Uh, ball. Okay, so we use this Zorsebang theory, you know. This is the thing to classify the ball, so we have to use this. Now, suppose, suppose this is true. That means we can find an F. F is in the automorphism. But this F is not, I call DH. H is isometry. This way means you have isometry H, and you identify this isometry with the differential Okay, so this F is not DH for any isometry H. This is very rough, okay? Then we look at, this is our M, this is our ground tube. Suppose you have such a F, F is automorphism, but F doesn't come from the isometry. Then you fix a point here, any point you choose, okay? Then, because now we do automorphism, this automorphism is F. This automorphism doesn't come from isometry. Means this automorphism they will move this P a little bit away from the M itself. Okay, so we, we actually we use some some the edge of our technique. Then you can move this a little bit. Then again we do this a little bit here is the technical part. Then eventually you can construct a sequence of automorphism group sending you to the point here. But here it's very good. We know it's traditional convex. Then this thing has to be the ball as a contradiction. So this tells us this is impossible. That means any automorphism must come from the isometry. Okay, this is the proof. Okay, now let's go to the theory. Actually, after I proved the theory, I got my tenure, and then, 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 then. I was in Germany for many years, and I tried to, to work with them, because I think nobody liked ground tube. And I tried to, I tried to abandon the ground tube, and I tried to, to get something done with them, but still, it's not successful. And at the end, I, I was in Bochum for the whole year, 2004. Then, at the end of my stay in Bochum, I think I have to, I have to go back to, to find some problem to do. Okay, you cannot rely on other people. If the problem is good and doable, people won't tell you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I think it's a way of growing and learning. At the beginning, I always think, oh, people might, might give you some problem. It's very good. You'll get really rely on doable. But at the end, I find out if there is such kind of problem, they will do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, at the, I think at the end of my stay in Bokhong, I try to find my own problem. Actually, I'm, I'm very happy. This is the first problem I find for myself, honestly, because the, the thing before that I just follow uh, is an extension of my thesis. And this is the first problem I, I, I find. OK, then I, one day I find this part. I was reading a paper of bad form. Then I find it, and I think, OK, maybe we can do that. And I was so, so happy because we have this theory already. Then I think, I want to say that. I can always find it. So the naive thing is, I, I think if we choose, given a lead group, OK, G is a lead group. OK, we work on this. And then G is any left invariant metric in D group. There are a lot of, OK, left invariant metric. Then, of course, as a remote metaphor, this G this big group equipped with this metric, this is a real analytical Riemann metaphor.
Okay, then we can apply because here the only thing we ask for oh, also is homogeneous. Of course, it's homogeneous because homogeneous means you can move for any two points. You can find an isometry move from point one to point two. Okay, and this is the degree. Of course, it's homogeneous. So actually, I was very happy. I think oh, it's done. But then it's one line. Okay, so I think now this is actually from the finish of this paper to the find of this is maybe two years or three years. And then after I find this problem. It took me two, two whole years to finish to get that. Okay, so this is a real analytic Riemann manifold, and I can apply this. Then, great by the theory, the automorphism. Okay, I write down the the. This is the Riemann manifold M. Then the automorphism group of this ground tube. By theory, it's an isometric group. Okay. And then I think this is isometric of this D group. <coughs> then I think this one should be G. I was very naive because I know nothing on the D group. <laughs> so, so really, I think naivety is a great power. And I think, okay, I do that. But then I was disappointed. There's only one line. Apply the theory, only one line. And then I was very naive. I think this should be G. And I remember at that time, Professor. The one in Berkeley, what is it? In constant curvature, the professor. Wolf. Uh, Wolf. Yeah, he was in Berkeley, uh, in, in Bokholm. So I asked him. Then he told me, no, 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 this is impossible. This isometry group is actually G times isotropic group. OK? So the thing we want is the automorphism group. Here I write as automorphism TRG, OK? Equal to here. And I think I'm done, okay? But Professor Wolf told me, no, no, no. This isometry is G times isotropy. And in general, this isotropy is very, very large. So you can find a complex manifold. It's very good. This is complete hyperbolic Stein. But the automorphism, uh, this part is very huge. So you cannot answer the problem. Then I was very naive. Then I asked Professor Wolf whether it's possible to classify Lie group, to classify Lie group. So that the, uh, those D group has identity as isotropy. <laughs> then I think at the time it's the time to leave Hong Kong. Then I went back to Taiwan and I borrowed from the library. Well, library our library has everything, every book in the world. So I borrowed a lot of the uh, Lie group and I studied studying D group from the definition. And I tried to classify D group. <coughs> I try to classify the group to so say that I, I think at least I can answer the problem. Say for each kind, for such kind of the group, then we can answer the problem. But then I think it's after whole years hard working. Then I know it's impossible. Then I know I have there is nobody to ask. I just work on my own. Then I think it's after the whole years hard working. I think this this is impossible. Okay, so we have to change another way. This is naive. But because of this naive thinking, they give me hope. I can do that. OK, so we have 10 minutes. Now we have to change our way to view the problem. OK, now let's have a second look in the ground tube. OK, again, let's fix this G, the center, to be the D group. Then let's look at the ground tube. What is the ground tube? Let's think about that again. This is our center G. OK, so the ground tube. TR is what? It's a collation of ten, uh, tangent vectors. Unless this is not. It's a Dick's bundle, OK? Because this is a deep group, once you know the property at one point, everything moves, shift. Once you know the property at one point, then the whole thing is known. So what is a ground tube? In fact, let me denote this disk. Let me fix a P, OK? Let me fix a P, fix P in G. Now let me denote this is the Dix bundle. Um, OK, a, a disk bundle at a P. OK, so what is the ground tube? TRG. In fact, it's just the move of this. Once you decide a, a disk, then you can shift. You, can, you, you have a disk, then you shift. This is your ground tube. Okay. 
And in this way, we can see that the automorphism of this G of here, there are two parts of contribution from this. First, the shift the along G, they will contribute the automorphism along this disk, along, along the way. And there is another contribution from this. You have a disk, you can rotate, okay? This is our disk. Let me do the two-dimensional case. What is this? This delta P is this disk. Then in this disk, you can rotate. So there are two parts of, of automorphism. This is the G part. This is the isotropy part, isotropy part, okay? So at this time, when I rethink, I get stuck on that for more than one year, and then one day I think I have to, I have to go away. Then I, I view things this way. I know this is impossible dream, okay? So actually, there are two parts of automorphism. One part comes from this G part. Another part is the rotation. So we have to kill out this, this part. Unless we can do that, otherwise it's impossible, okay? So now, here, this is the ground tube. Let, let me draw this way. Ground tube is this the disk. And then you move along, shift along this. This is our ground tube. Okay. Now what happened? I think I don't like this to be a disk because as we see before, the disk has too much symmetry. Okay. So now instead of this disk bundle, we chose something. We perturb. Okay. We perturb this. We try to perturb this to destroy the symmetry. Actually, this is well related to what Professor Conte Kim has said before uh, two days ago. At that time, I also read a paper of Greiner and Kronz on this kind of thing. Try, try to, to try to get help. Okay, so the idea is, um, as I mentioned before, the automorphism is G times isotropy. So now we no longer consider ground tube. We consider a special case of ground tube. Now ground tube is a sub subcase. Instead of the disk bundle, we don't do disk bundle. Okay, we do something in this part. There is no symmetry in this way. It's possible to answer the problem. So we define a general version of ground tube. I call the G domain. Okay, <coughs> again, given a Lie group G, G is a Lie group. This is a given Lie group. Then we decide. We say a D equal to G. It's a G domain. That's just a definition. And, and, the, and the geometric meaning is this way. You have this, this FP, OK? If, first of all, FP is a subset of the tangent, of the tangent space, OK, bounded. I would like to have bounded. And the second, this G acts transitively. on M, okay? And then this D lies in the tangent bundle, okay? So this is a more, uh, it, it's a G domain. And actually, when this P, this is a remark, if this P is a thick bundle at P, then this is just a ground tube. Say it's a, a disk bundle of radius r, then it's just a ground tube. So this is more general, uh, more generalized rotation than ground tube. Okay. Um, what? G acts transitively. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Okay. This is um. This D is a domain, sorry, I should say this is um, a domain in the tangent bundle and contained N, okay? Here this is your remand manifold, okay? Get, at, the, at first, we have a remand manifold and we consider on this tangent bundle and there is a, 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 a D group G, usually we take the isometry group of this, D, of this remand manifold, yeah. Okay, so this is a general version of ground tube. And this way, we can 
do something like this. We can do that. And one thing good is because the horizontal move is decided by this D group. So although this is a non-compact case, I think the secret is here. This is a non-compact case. And usually people can, it has difficulty to take care of non-compact case. But with this group, group action, okay, once your property is known here, then everything just shift. Then you can ignore the non-compact part. And here the vertical part, because we chose finite radius, so it's more or less compact. And then the horizontal part is decided by the, you know, the, the, this translation. Okay, and also we know in a ground tube case, sorry, in a ground tube case, this is a strictly pseudo convex. So we want, we want to make sure this one is still strictly pseudo convex. But it's okay because you can do a small perturbation. Because traditional convex means this Hessian is positive, okay? Then you can do small perturbation just in this part, in a co-compact part. You can do small perturbation so, such that this Hessian is still, real, is still positive. Then it's traditional convex. Once it's traditional convex nearby, then everything just move. Then the non-compact can be covered, okay? So this is the, the trick. In any case, from now on, the domain we we consider will be this G domain. It's a generalized ground tube. And then following the same thing, because I have been so familiar with that. So once, I have the, once we have this setting, then it's, it's not hard to prove the similar theory for that. OK, so the theory is if G is a domain, is a rigid domain, of course, when I choose this delta p, this is uh, this fp is not arbitrary. We can it's just a small perturbation of the disk to to guarantee that the resulting thing is still traditional convex. Okay, so if d is a G domain, it's traditional convex. Then we can we can get something I call sub rigidity. Okay, here I call sub rigidity. Okay, we can find that either this D is the ball or this automorphism D, of course, is greater than the G. Okay, and it's less than, this is greater than, less than isometry, the M. Okay, the rigidity says this is equal, but here it can be this. Okay. So once we have this re sub rigidity problem property, so let's modify our tube. Okay. Once we, we have that, now we go we go further on that one. Okay, here again the problem says that G be a connected D group. Now we fix the G a connected D group. Okay, now we the remark metaphor is this. With the left invariant metric, it's real and analytic. Now we consider, we choose, okay, we, we, we consider this P, a G homogeneous domain. D equal to G is moved by this D group. Okay, this D group is, uh, uh, acts on, on this M transitively, okay, times at P. So this is the thing. And we know by the theory, if that's not a ball, that time we will, sh we will use Chambers theory to show that the, that's not a ball. If that's not a ball, then not a ball. By the sub rigidity, automorphism D is greater than G. And that's then the isometry group of G. Because now M is G. It's G times isotropy. Okay. For reasonably good, we can cho we can have this result. Now we chose good FP so that here this one can be cured out. Okay. So now the thing is the choice of this FP. Again, FP is a subset in the tangent bundle. Okay. Let me do the dimension two dimensional case. Okay. Let's say this is E one E two. In a ground tube, this is our F, uh, the disk bundle, say distance one. Here we want to construct FP. This is, um, okay, uh, this is the ball. 
So the thing is, we try to perturb this to destroy the symmetry. OK, first, to destroy the symmetry. Second, we have to pre preserve the strongly shifted convexity. OK, so the thing I do is, I perturb this this way. Sorry. I will, um, and I would like to that it's symmetry to this. We we want to z to z by symmetry, okay? We have to so the perturb is like this. This is the same size, and then in this part, the symmetry part, we perturb a little more. Okay. Of course, we have to do some kind of uh, many calculations on the kind of function such that. This, after the perturbation, this GFP, this is our FP, new FP. This is our new FP, such that this GFP is still traditional convex, OK? If this is not too huge, then it's guaranteed, OK? We do this way, such that here, there is no, no translation beside um, I z to z bar to positive to negative. But from Z to Z bar, this is anti-holomorphic. It's not holomorphic. This is anti-holomorphic, not holomorphic, so it's OK, OK? So in this way, if we choose FP this way, then we will have this. With good choice of FP, we will have this automorphism D equal to GFP has the isometric the automorphism group is greater than G, greater or equal to G, less than G, so it's G. And also the next thing is we have to show this is not a ball, okay? So there is a way to see whether it's a ball by Tremoser. We can compute the Tremoser, uh, th that identity, okay? So when, you, when we do the count of function here, in local coordinate, we start to minus something with power 4. This is X. Something like that, then it, it will be safe to, to guarantee that this cannot be spherical. Then it's not spherical, the whole thing cannot be the ball. Okay. And also the hyperbolic, the hyperbolic part is easy because now everything is translated along this D group. So once you, you know the hyperbolic distance is more or less like distance here to there is you, you are distant from here to here and then jump, 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 jump. So it's infinity. And then to the strongly shooter part is part, okay. And Stein. Stein is OK because anyway, I, I won't explain here. But actually, Stein is a part. <laughs> Let me start for half a year. Yeah. But I, later on, I find out it's not so, so hard. Yeah. Because we have this kind of, um, you have to use some, some invariant theory. And time is out. <laughs>